for joining us. Thanks for joining us today. So today we have um, Dr. Josh Vermas here with us, and he's a assistant professor at Michigan State University's Plant Research Laboratory, and his research is focused on using molecular simulations to study photosynthesis, plant metabolism, and biosynthesis, and on developing new simulation techniques. Dr. Vermas got his undergraduate degrees in biochemistry, physics, and computational mathematics from Arizona State University, and he went on to a PhD in biophysics at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where he was part of the Department of Energy's Computational Science Graduate Fellowship. After his doctorate, he went on to a postdoc at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and a computational science position at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Today, he'll be discussing his ongoing and past research using molecular simulation techniques to develop mechanistic insight into nanoscale biology for a sustainable bioeconomy. All right, so thanks so much, and I'll let him take it away. Thank you, Olivia, for, Olivia, for the introduction. Uh, so again, my name is Joshua Moss, uh, newly appointed assistant professor at Michigan State University. And I do kind of the things that you should be seeing on the screen where we like will animate biological systems at the molecular scale to learn about how they work. Um, and the idea behind this is like, okay, we've been studying biological systems for a long time, right? So if you look in the, in the uh, uh, upper left, we used to use our eyes and we could see just whole plants, but limited by optics, there's only so much that you can learn if you don't start looking at smaller length and time scales. So you can break that down into, uh, go get yourself a microscope, look at things at sort of the, the scale of bacteria, but then you're actually diffraction limited. So again, getting a little bit of physics in there, there's only a certain amount that you can resolve uh, invisible wavelengths. If you decide to use x-rays, you can go make these sort of x-ray crystal structures by using shorter wavelengths and get around that diffraction problem. Um, but at some point, those also have their limitations. And so by using the flexibility that we have uh, by using like computational horsepower, we can use molecular dynamic simulations to probe time and length scales for um, molecular events that we'd otherwise have a really hard time tracking uh, through experiment. Um, and molecular simulation is a really powerful tool, but it has two big requirements. So we need the positions for all the particles and we need a description for how those particles move in time. All right, so again, we can go use this on large supercomputers. Um, and what this boils down to, for those of you who are, uh, who are unfamiliar, because again, it's a bioinformatics uh, department, and so there's a broad range of folks working in different things, is Newton's first uh, Newton's laws of motion, right? So the force that is experienced on every atom in our molecular simulation system, that's going to be equal to the mass of that particle times the acceleration that that particle feels. Now, the question is, how do we get those forces? And there are a lot of different ways that you could do this. So there are if you're gonna go all out, we're gonna do quantum chemistry to go figure out what the forces are on every atom at every point in time. That's super accurate, but super slow. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with, with some of these uh, quantum mechanical techniques, if you double the amount of atoms that you need to calculate, uh, you can make the computational expense go up by a factor of 128. So these scale is like order uh, the number of atoms to the seventh or the eighth power. So it's really expensive to like calculate large systems. Where I work is in the classical regime where we make approximations uh, that I'll get to in a minute uh, that make this cheap enough to do reasonably quickly. Uh, you can lump multiple atoms together to create like a united atom model or a coarse grain model. These are faster because you have fewer particles you need to go calculate. And you can sort of keep going down uh, down that ladder that are just less accurate models that are faster. Now, all right, how do we go calculate our forces in the classical land where I'm going to live? And um, here, the force is gonna be the negative gradient to the potential energy. So again, this is like physics definition stuff. 
And where we come up with our potential energy function is we're gonna have a non-bonded part and a bonded part. Uh, that non-bonded part is, for those of you who, who took intro physics, some of this should look familiar, right? Hopefully you can see my mouse, but oh, hey, here's a charge, here's another charge divided by four pi epsilon naught over R between the distance between those two particles. That's the electrostatic force. Those of you who also took your basic physics, hey, this kind of looks like the equation for a spring. There's a force constant and then some resting, resting uh, uh, length squared. Basically, what classical length dynamics simulations does is instead of assuming that things behave quantum mechanically, we assume that atoms are connected by springs if they're bonded. And if they're not, they interact through uh, van der Waals and electrostatic terms um, between, those, uh, between those atoms. All right, now, everything I've told you so far is super generic, right? We don't have to know anything about the biology to make these kinds of models. And molecular dynamics is applied to all kinds of different systems. Um, but what I'm gonna be focusing on are three different stories today uh, that cover like different parts of biological systems. So one of them is gonna be looking at protein ligand interactions. So on the, on the left here, um, we have um, one lipid that's sort of intercalating itself into a protein and is involved in plant signaling. Um, we can look at how small molecules will permeate through this carboxysome-like shell. So this is, another, this is involved in photosynthesis in uh, cyanobacteria. Or we can look at enzyme disassociation if we have time. This is the only part that's actually published. Um, and I did that back when I was a postdoc at, at NRO. All right, so um, again, some, sometimes I, I like to show pretty movies. This is a totally different system altogether that highlights the power of molecular dynamic simulations. So here was like a 24 million atom system that, I, that at the time was run on one of the largest supercomputers in the world. Um, uh, and these red fibers, those are cellulose. The green, or sorry, the blue blobs are lignin. So these are part of a plant cell wall. And the green guys are cellulases. And the idea is, is that for biofuels or bioproducts, you want the cellulases to come along and break down the cellulose, but they get interfered with when they run into lignin that's also attached to the cellulose fiber. Um, and we can do all kinds of analysis that can emphasize and take these pictures that we see from our molecular simulation trajectories and do all kinds of other analysis, right? To say, oh, lignin and cellulose, they make a lot of interactions. And uh, in fact, lignin will cover about a quarter of the cellulose surface, which means that, oh, these cellulases as they come along will have to unbind pretty frequently. And that's actually sort of the, the reason for the last project I'm gonna show you where we're gonna be looking at how cellulases unbind uh, from cellulose. All right, so, so now, now to the main part of this, um, we're gonna be, be talking over three different projects. So one is how plants will respond to drought stress and investigation into one particular protein that, that carries this drought stress trigger across the plant. Um, one's looking at a, that uh, carboxysome structure that I showed earlier. And the third is to uh, determine the enzyme mechanism for cellulase. So again, all of this is being done computationally uh, through molecular dynamic simulations. All right, so let's get started with the drought stress protein PLAFP. And here, uh, the way that this works is, let's say that you're a plant. Uh, in this particular case, the plant on the left being shown is an Arabidopsis plant. So for those of you who work in plant systems, Arabidopsis is your bread and butter, most likely. Um, let's say that there's a heat stress represented by this uh, lightning symbol here that will trigger specific lipids to show up on your, on your membranes, which um, this protein, uh, PLAFP, will pick up somehow and then take it through the phloem to other tissues in the plant to carry that drought stress signal elsewhere, right? Because if there is not enough water to go around and you, you feel that you are in a drought, you should probably change your metabolism, not just in that single leaf or place that is first finding the stress, but should be distributed over the whole plant. 
Um, and what we had found uh, was, all right, so here's this protein. Does it bind to biological membranes? And the answer is, yeah, eventually it will. Um, but then what we don't see is necessarily how these lipids will eventually make their way into the protein. And that's kind of gonna be kind of like one of the larger questions that we're, that we're trying to address. So from a lot of these um, membrane binding simulations, right? Where we have this protein moving around and anchoring itself, hopefully into the membrane, we can do a lot of different quantification. And what we see sort of in the end is shown pictorially here on the right, where these two residues, this uh, tryptophan 41 and arginine 82, embed themselves most deeply into the membrane. And the membrane here is sort of represented by this transparent surface. Now, how do we know that those are the ones that are, being, are most consistently uh, bound? The way that we see this is, is to look at this uh, quantitation here on the left, where we're taking the protein residue on the x-axis and then the distance relative to the center of the membrane on the y-axis. And you'll notice that right here, here's your tryptophan 41. That's usually the deepest uh, thing that's inserted. And here is your 82, which is the other part that consistently is close to the membrane. Uh, other areas where it gets close to the membrane, it's a lot more loosey-goosey in a way, right? There, there is a larger distribution of, of the probability for where that residue is um, over the course of the simulation. All right, so that's where we're gonna highlight right there. The other thing that we noticed once we started running these, these calculations is, huh, the protein at the end of the simulation does not look like the protein like there was at the beginning. So in an aqueous environment, right? So without the membrane being present, this is the probability dense distribution as a function of distance between these two residues. And they're basically like really close together. That's on, not very, not particularly helpful if you're trying to bind a lipid. But once it has associated to the membrane, you can create these kinds of uh, states where because they these two residues are both interacting with the membrane, they sort of spread apart, creating this like crevice where you can bind uh, lipids into. Um, so, all right, that, that's, that's interesting. Could we actually get this thing to bind? And I had a rotation student who's now in my group as well as an undergraduate um, who went to go test this by simulating this setup that I had shown previously where you have, here's our arginine 82, here's our tryptophan 41, and we're going to just restrain this phosphatidic acid, which is the drought signaling uh, molecule, so that it can't leave the, the surface near here. What is actually going to happen? And what we see, even though we ran 10 replicates of this, I'm only gonna show you one of them, is that within a microsecond or so, uh, this lipid has sort of flipped itself up and is now intercalating its tails into the middle uh, of the protein. So we were really stunned when we saw this because that was not what we expected, right? So the prior published literature just kind of made a guess and said, oh yeah, that, that phosphatidic acid probably goes into the middle of the, of the protein somehow and the lipid tails are stuck on the outside. But that actually seems to be the opposite of what, what happened here where the lipid tails somehow end up in the middle and the phosphatidic acid head group is still facing to the outside. Um, and what they'll do is they'll sort of insert into this stack of beta sheets that's inside the protein structure. Now, okay, that's great. Phosphatidic acid is one potential signaling molecule, but there are other lipids too. How does it know to only pick up that one? Um, and what we, what we decided to do, and this is again, the power that we have of working computationally, is we can do alchemical things where we are going to transform a lipid from one identity to another over a number of individual intermediate states. And so long as we keep track of those intermediate states carefully enough, and we do some math afterwards, we can calculate 
what the free energy change is of transforming this phosphatidic acid head group into a phosphatidylcholine head group. So you're adding in this whole extra choline head group that I'm uh, hopefully highlighting here uh, in the middle. And again, uh, the, the technical term for this is a free energy perturbation technique. Uh, so we're gonna be transforming PA to PC and then calculate the difference in free energy as we change this fictitious lambda value from minus one to one. Um, the upshot of this is actually something that, that really comes back, comes back to physical chemistry. So for those of you who have taken enough chemistry classes, you've probably been introduced to a uh, free energy or a Gibbs free energy, often abbreviated to delta G. And one of the really interesting features of delta G is if you create a reaction cycle, right? So you go from here to here, to here, to here, to here, all the way around the cycle, the total free energy change around that cycle must be zero because you ended up started at the same place. Clearly that, that must involve a total change that ends up being zero. So uh, the key thing here is, oh, if we change PA to, P, uh, to a phosphatidylcholine in solution, that's something that we can calculate pretty easily. And it's actually a fairly small change. We're only adding this like little, little thing onto the head of our, of our lipid. We can do the same thing in the protein. And that will then tell us these transitions that we cannot do, what the free energy change difference ought to be. So we do this, we calculate these two numbers. So we're going from PA to PC in solution. If we do that transition, that costs 24.6 kcals per mole plus minus 0.1 kcal per mole in energy. To do this in the presence of the protein, that costs more, right? So if you are a PA molecule, you would much rather be bound here than you would to be free in solution compared to the PC molecule, right? So, and that is true by about 11.6 kcals per mole plus minus 0.2. So it is way more favorable for PA to bind than for PC to bind. Um, and again, that, that's just a change of adding in a, a, a choline group um, to it. But we can also do this for other uh, lipid types. And again, uh, for those of you who are, who are well into lipids, uh, you will know that um, PC and PE are two kinds of Switter ionic phospholipids and the free energy change there is very strong and very positive. So they will bind less well to uh, PLAFP uh, than, than PA would. However, other anionic phospholipids, so this is PI is phosphatidyl inositol, uh, PG is phosphatidyl glycerol, uh, glycerol, and then PS is phosphatidyl serine, I believe. These all have free energies that bind kind of similar to how PA does. And what was really gratifying is we thought we were initially wrong, but then we went to go show this to our experimental collaborators and they're like, oh, that is exactly what we see because we also see binding and we didn't expect this either to PI, P PG and PS. So, okay, great. Um, that that kind of tells you like, oh, we're doing something right and we can learn something interesting about how plants respond to drought stress, right? So they will take that PA and it is specific to anionic phospholipids of some form or another, unbind it from the membrane and then take it somewhere else through the phloem. Um, so that's like one part of this story that I'd like to tell of how molecular simulation can like teach us things about plants and energy. Um, but now we'll do something a little bit different and talk about how permeable carboxysomes are. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with carboxysomes, uh, they are a type of bacterial microcompartment. And you might be thinking like, wait a second, microcompartment, that sounds suspiciously like an organelle. I thought bacteria didn't have organelles. This is actually one of the exceptions, right? So um, bacteria can make these protein shells that encapsulate other proteins to create like a catalytic center of some kind that will do a really important reaction. And what the carboxysome 
does is it will, uh, it's the carbon concentrating mechanism in cyanobacteria, where you have this protein shell that surrounds Rubisco and carbonic anhydrase. So carbonic anhydrase, that is an enzyme that will take bicarbonate and turn it into carbon dioxide. And then Rubisco will integrate uh, that carbon dioxide into central metabolism through the uh, Calvin cycle. So again, if we go take a look at this uh, Calvin cycle in the totally not stolen from uh, Khan Academy figure, um, we take in the CO2, Rubisco very, it does very difficult chemistry very well, but it's a little bit inefficient because it can't distinguish it from oxygen. So somehow that carboxysome is helping to create this, this reaction happen more effectively by just sort of like keeping oxygen away from Rubisco by one, by one way or another. Um, and if oxygen were to come into co close contact with, with Rubisco, uh, you'd go through a photorespiratory uh, pathway, which among other things, will uh, spit back out carbon dioxide that then you need to have two ATPs to basically turn um, carbon dioxide into CO2 and you basically end up where, where you started, started from. So photorespiration, at least for photosynthetic organisms is bad. So uh, um, what you'd instead like to have is for photosynthesis to take place where carbon dioxide is, is spun out to make sugars uh, of larger and larger sizes so that you can keep using those um, and capture that light energy. Um, so the, uh, but the trick is, okay, within this carboxysome, how does that help, right? Like we wanna keep oxygen out, but we also wanna let CO2 in and bicarbonate's involved in there somehow. So could it be that maybe just the transport of uh, bicarbonate comes in, gets converted by carbonic anhydrase into CO2, and then somehow CO2 can't leave? Because that would be really good, right? You'd, you'd increase the concentration of CO2 locally, and it, then it would be integrated by Rubisco um, so that it can't, uh, or, or so that, that CO2 is efficiently converted into central metabolism. Okay, um, so the questions that we're trying to ask through molecular dynamics is, is the carboxysome selectively permeable? Will gases like CO2 or O2 remain trapped either inside the carboxysome like CO2 or outside the carboxysome like oxygen? How permeable is carboxysome to other photosynthetic metabolites, right? Because technically the sugar has to make it out in order for the rest for the organism to use it. So clearly these small molecules have to be able to make it out somehow. How fast do they make it out? Those are some of the, the questions that we can answer with a molecular simulation. And what sorts of features from the carboxysome will regulate how permeable this shell actually is? Um, so the way that we do this, there was a cryo-EM structure that was solved for a synthetic carboxysome, which is much smaller than the real thing, right? So if you're paying attention way back when, the number of uh, components to this shell should be like several thousand proteins. Uh, this is 30 of these blue hexamers and 12 of these pentamers. So this is a much smaller system that is tractable for us to simulate uh, while still being letting us test like how fast do things go from one side to the other. So we're going to make a very high substrate concentration inside compared to what you'd see physiologically. And then uh, this is just to improve our samplings. So we see more transition events going from one side, of the, one side of the carboxysome to the other. And we can do this because nowadays uh, GPUs have really accelerated what you can do for a computer simulation. So this is a paperback from, from 2019 where like a V100 could get you about eight nanoseconds per day for a really big system. Uh, this was 2.1 million atoms. Nowadays, uh, this is not even all that much further along. This is a roughly similar size system where we can get like 30 nanoseconds of sampling in a single day on hardware that is reasonably easy to get our hands on. Um, so 
500 nanoseconds is now going to represent about one to two months worth of, of like experiment time, basically. All right. So I promised that we were going to use the atomistic resolution to go track how many things are going in and out, right? And we're going to make an approximation. And I think this approximation is actually pretty good, right? Is this kind of looks like a circle. So we're going to measure the position of every atom or every molecule relative to the center of that sphere. And that this gray region here, that's where roughly the radius where the carboxysome shell itself is. And this red trace is, oh, that's the, that's the radial position of this molecule as a function of time. And these are just for water molecules because we were testing whether we could do this yes or no. But you can clearly see like, oh yeah, this starts on the outside, makes its way in, and now it's mostly trapped on the inside again. All right. Um, and we can do this repeatedly for multiple different molecules. Um, one of the things that we noticed was, all right, we thought that all of these permeation events would happen through the center of, um, of these pores that are made inside the carboxysome. So if you take a hexamer, there's gonna be a pore right through the middle. And sometimes it's true, uh, the water molecules that we're tracking go through the center of this hexamer. Sometimes they'll go through the center of the pentamer, but sometimes they'll go like in between two hexamers or they'll go in between the interface of a hexamer or a pentamer, or they'll go between three hexamers or they will take various different pathways from the inside to the outside of the, of the carboxysome. And what really surprised us is like, okay, here's the, the standard thing that we expected where they go through the hexamer. Here's the less common, but still pretty standard. It goes through the pentamer. Here's everything else. And that makes up about a quarter of all of the transition events that we were capturing. So we can't just say that like uh, these carboxysomes are going to be super watertight because they're not. We see a lot of water permeation events, right? So over 1.5 microseconds, we see almost 93,000 water molecules going across um, uh, across the shell. And we also see that they don't all happen uh, in the way that we expected. So we can of course also do this for carbon dioxide, oxygen, bicarbonate, uh, 3PGA or uh, ribulose bisphosphate, and then see how many permeation events do we get and then go convert that into a permeability coefficient. Um, and, and one of the things that we didn't entirely expect, but seems kind of obvious in retrospect, is, huh, bicarbonate or 3PGA, these both are negatively charged and pretty big. They almost exclusively go through either the pentamer, so labeled as five, or the hexamer, uh, or hexamer pores labeled as six. Whereas the gases, they go wherever they want. And you cannot easily distinguish like they're not just following the pore, they also go through interfaces really frequently. The other thing that really caught my eye was, well, hey, look look at this. That's like, we get 300 permeation events over our simulation length. Here we get like 90. It's faster actually to, to for uh, like carbon dioxide or oxygen to leak out compared with bicarbonate. So it actually kind of looks like, uh, these things may not be very selectively permeable at all. And they might just be like a, a, they keep gases in at least for a little bit before they uh, eventually find their way back out. Okay, so I, I've shown you how we measure permeability or permeation events. How do I translate those into something that like an experimentalist could measure? And the way that we do this is through Fick's law. So here we have our predicted flux. We need to figure out some permeability coefficient. We need to know what the area of our carboxysome is, and we need to know what the concentration difference is on both sides. So in our simulation, you may be like, wait a second, Josh, this doesn't make any sense. You, you didn't make a concentration difference. How are you going to deal with this? Um, so instead, uh, we are going to calculate this permeability coefficient through a way that has been validated for biological membranes where you're gonna take the transition rate and then divide it by twice the solute concentration in water. 
This works out to be the same thing. And that is what lets us, since we know our transition rate, since we know how long we simulated and how many transitions we saw, that will give us a permeability coefficient that we can actually then estimate what fluxes are going to be. So we have this big, really big table and um, I'm not gonna expect you to remember much from this table other than uh, to look over here at this log base 10 of the permeability coefficient. So since we're operating here in log scale, numbers that are around minus two or close to minus two end up being 10 to the minus two centimeters per second. So that, that, again, that's just the units for the permeability coefficient. And what got us uh, uh, kind of excited, and I'll get to that in a minute, is like, okay, if we take 2000 molecules, uh, like how much concentration difference could we have from one side of this carboxysome shell to the other? So again, here's our flux. We now know our permeability coefficient. If we, we wanna go solve for uh, the change in concentration, because we know that Rubisco turns over about once a second. Um, and if you take this picture over here, we have about 2000 copies of Rubisco with a reasonably sized membrane surface area. The concentration difference between the inside and the outside of, um, uh, of this carboxysome, that concentration difference actually has to be really big to be able to saturate um, Rubisco. But um, that's kind of like a, a very simple model. It turns out people did a much more rigorous model of this way back in 2014, where they were trying to figure out, okay, what should the optimal permeability coefficient be to make this work really well? Um, so the unknowns that they had was they didn't know how fast bicarbonate flux would go into the cell and they didn't know the carboxysome permeability. Uh, the, this study found that the optimum was near 10 to the minus two centimeters per second, which is basically what we had found as the permeability coefficients through our, um, uh, through our study. And the reason why 10 to the minus two ends up being this magic number is kind of expressed in this graph here, where if you're in this red zone, where you have really high carboxysome permeability and really fast bicarbonate transport, the carbonic anhydrase number that you have inside of there is not high enough. And so carbonic anhydrase literally can't turn over bicarbonate fast enough. Um, if you are over here in the blue region, you don't have enough transport to keep Rubisco saturated. If you are in this white region uh, where carboxysome permeability is pretty high and you don't quite have enough bicarbonate in there to feed Rubisco, well, then you have this problem of photorespiration where oxygen is going to be used instead. So if you're right here, that's kind of the optimum point where you don't have very, many, very much photorespiration, but you also make basically as much stuff as you can without having to do a lot of active transport of bicarbonate. So you'll notice that that's basically 10 to the minus two centimeters per second, which is what we found through our molecular dynamics models. So it fits really well. And that's kind of the direction where we're now working with our experimental colleagues to figure out like, hey, how do we explain this difference? Um, now we haven't talked about our uh, ribulose bisphosphate yet. So this is another larger sugar molecule. And we only saw six transition events for that. Um, so that's kind of like a work in progress for us because what's happening in the um, uh, what is happening in the hexamers is that here you have this positively charged amino acid. Here's your lysine. Here is this uh, uh, threonine at the bottom of this like little pore that's sort of closing off the pore. And because ribulose bisphosphate has a negative charge on both ends of it, it has a phosphate here and a phosphate here. That's why it's bisphosphate. It just isn't actually able to permeate through the pore very effectively. So that's why you have a very small number of transition events. And we're thinking, well, maybe the problem is our synthetic carboxysome. Um, 
because it is missing the trimeric component, which has a larger pore, which may be able to better accommodate ribulose bisphosphate. So anyway, the take home message for this part of, of uh, the discussion is, is the carboxysome selective per selectively permeable? The answer appears to be no. Uh, it appears that the carboxysome is permeable to all different manners of things at roughly the right, or roughly the right rate, which is already optimal for um, uh, photosynthesis. Will gases such as carbon dioxide and oxygen remain trapped inside the carboxysome? Nope, they will make their way out. Uh, the trick is going to be to make sure that, that carbon dioxide specifically finds its way to a rubisco before it uh, leaves the carboxysome again. Uh, how permeable is carboxysome to photosynthetic metabolites? Basically optimal again, so 10 to the minus two centimeters per second. And what features of the carboxysome will regulate uh, shell permeability? So that hexameric pore, especially for charged substrates, is going to be very critical uh, for keeping larger molecules in or out. Okay, so I think I've left myself just enough time to do the third part of this, which is the, the actually published part where we're going to be looking at the enzyme mechanism for acellulase. And again, these are just sort of demonstrating the, the utility uh, for molecular simulation in studying different biological systems. So uh, this was work I did at NREL, which of course means that there are, there's actually a graphics department who like can do stuff and, and show, us, show us nice things. And this is like the pictorial animation of how this cellulase works, right? So it kind of looks like a dinosaur. So it has a carbohydrate binding module, which is like the head of the dinosaur sticking out the front. And then there's a catalytic domain, which is sort of riding along behind that carbohydrate binding module. And that sort of slurps up one, uh, one cellulose strand and then uh, does some catalytic activity uh, to break that cellulose strand up into a bunch of disaccharides, so uh, cellobios, so two glucose uh, monomers stuck together. And then further enzymes will break that disaccharide into monosaccharides again. So folks at, when I was working at NREL had characterized all different parts of, of this cellulase. So people had worked on binding and association, um, people had worked on processivity, so how easily can it slip uh, from one, uh, one disaccharide to the next disaccharide in the chain, as well as the uh, catalytic activity. But what folks hadn't really realized, and again, that's, this is thinking back way to the beginning of, of, the, of the talk, um, where the enzyme itself is dissociation limited. So in a real context where there isn't just cellulose, what will happen is that the enzyme has to process along and then stop and dissociate in order to find another end that isn't blocked by a different biopolymer, either a lignin or another protein or whatever, what have you. Um, so how does this enzyme dissociate and how do we know the mechanism? So what interactions could be altered to sort of help you improve dissociation and make things go faster um, uh, in an engineering context, right? Because the environmental selective pressures that, that were applied to fungi, where a lot of these enzymes were isolated from, so long as that fungi can make more fungi, the fungi is happy. But we, as industrial folks, who would like to be able to use um, plant material as a feedstock, you want to be able to turn that feedstock over really quickly so that you don't have to make really big vats uh, for these reactions to take place in. Um, so how do we make, how do we make dissociation happen faster? And the important part here, here is, okay, we need to figure out how does dissociation happen? The, the, the cool part about this enzyme, and here I'm just showing the catalytic domain, is you can imagine two different ways for this uh, reaction to take place. Either you can sort of pull it out, um, like, I'm not sure how well you can see this over Zoom, but I am um, using my finger and sort of like pulling it out of uh, my hand because if you, this enzyme kind of looks like a hand. Or you could imagine like opening up your hand and then the, then the um, cellulose just kind of falls out, right? So we're going to call these the de-threading and the clamshell mechanism. So the clamshell is where the, where the hand sort of opens up and then the cellulose falls out and de-threading is where the cellulose just kind of de-threads uh, from the ins inside of the active site. 
And both of them look fine, right? Like I couldn't tell you before we started this how how fast either one was, um, but we have some target data, right? So people have been measuring this experimentally and uh, they have dissociation rates that range over th basically three orders of magnitude, depending on what method they used. And again, speaking computationally, this is amazing if the experimentalist can't agree because that makes your target values much wider of what is an acceptable answer. Um, but we're gonna be using simulation to determine the kinetics along both of these potential pathways and then compare to experiment to see which one makes sense. All right, so our, how do we get kinetics from a molecular dynamic simulation, right? I'm, I'm not going to sit here and simulate for 0.2 seconds. I, we don't have that kind of time. Uh, most molecular dynamic simulations are at most like a microsecond or so. So how do you do this? Um, what you basically need is you need the free energy along the pathway and you need diffusion along that pathway. And then you can go measure what the mean first passage time is and that's related to the inverse of the dissociation rate. Okay. Um, the reaction, we have to define our reaction coordinate, right? So how does the dethreading mechanism work? Um, and then the clamshell mechanism, well, that's gonna be harder, right? Because we have to both open something and make it fall out. Um, this actually got me to use more or less the entire uh, supercomputer that we had. Yeah, I, 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 hold on. I think I'll be done pretty quickly. Um, so th this got us using the, uh, the supercomputer we had at NREL. It was number 39 in the world for largest uh, supercomputers at the time. And I thought it was fun to be able to use the whole thing uh, for, for my science. It was really cool. Um, but, all right, here's our free energy profile. Uh, in red is the clamshell mechanism. Black is de-threading. I'm skipping over like a ton of the math that we don't actually want to see. But you can figure out, but you can see pretty pretty readily that like the, the, high, the barrier for the clamshell mechanism is really high. And because it's really high, the off rate along this mechanism is like two times 10 to the minus five per second. So if this was the only mechanism that was, a, that was allowed, uh, you would be waiting something on the order of days for one of these enzymes to unbind. However, through dissociation, uh, the free energy barriers were ended up being a lot smaller. You, and we got a number that was like, oh, 0.8 per second. It's a little bit faster than what was measured by AFM, but it's on the same order of magnitude. Like this seems pretty plausible. Um, and uh, coupled along to this is we had our experimental collaborators make a disulfide linkage uh, between the two parts of like the hand basically of this catalytic domain. So it would be locked together. And when it was locked together, the rate that they measured didn't change, which suggests that, that, that the opening of that hand was not actually important for dissociation. Uh, and that's, that's basically what we're seeing here is like, oh, with the uh, disulfide being made, being shown here like across the two halves so that it can't open, the measured rates are basically within the margin of error of one another. Um, so anyway, from the wild type, the dethreading mechanism is very clearly the correct one. Uh, so it matches the experimental dissociation rates and it's robust immunogenesis experiments. We also had a couple of ideas of, huh, what are some residues we could go mutate to make this better? Um, but, that's like a story for another time and another postdoc uh, who isn't me. Um, so what I want you to take away from this is, huh, we can do a lot with molecular dynamic simulations. We can look at things like permeability, plant cell walls, peripheral membrane protein binding. All of these are ongoing projects in the lab. Those, uh, that's actually where I got all of these nice figures from. Um, if you're interested, I, there is a postdoctoral position opening. So if you're interested, please come and reach out. I'd be happy to, happy to talk. Um, but otherwise, uh, I'd like to thank the folks uh, who did the work, in particular, Dapan Sarkar, who did a lot of the carboxysome work that I focused the middle of this on. Uh, but otherwise, I'd like to leave time for questions. Thanks.
Oh. I there are a couple questions in the chat. Do you want me to read them to people, or would you? I I I, I think I can read them. So. Okay. Uh, Benjamin asking, I'm studying proteins of unknown function with intrinsically disordered regions and poplars. Is it possible to use molecular modeling to infer their functions at scale? How to assess the feasibility? Okay, so um, intrinsically disordered regions are hard, right? Uh, they're intrinsically disordered, which means that you don't necessarily know the structure for them or even know if they are structurable. If you have like a really a clear question, molecular simulation can definitely help, right? Because we have enhanced sampling techniques that can get you a lot of different candidate structures and you can see which, which under what circumstances are specific structures more common than others, right? Um, unfortunately, I don't know how you would do this at scale, right? Because these are all doable questions, but if, if the question is like, Hold on, phone go away. Um, it's going to be a hard slog. I'd love to chat more. Send me an email um, to see what what your what your needs are. Um, because there's always alpha folds. Alpha folds is like the thing I will always recommend. Of have you? Throw it into AlphaFold and see what AlphaFold says. Maybe there's a structured region that you can do something more with. Um, yes. But so unstructured those, regions are hard. Hmm. For those proteins, they have very few, uh, like a super short of a helix. And recently, there's another paper coming out saying that they can outperform AlphaFold in terms of predicting structures for ovens. But anyway, hmm. I think I can use those softwares to produce uh, preliminary structures and then see what kind of questions they might really want to ask. Mm -hmm. I'll send you emails. Yep, thanks. Thanks. Um, so Kelvin said, or asked, can you model the, can your model for the carboxysome account for the possibility of co-transport of ribulose bisphosphate with cations? So uh, I didn't emphasize this part, but in our models, uh, we also include cations um, and anions, of course. Um, to raise the salt concentration to about 150 millimolar. So we, in the six, uh, six instances where, where RUBP did transport, um, we did not see ions necessarily coming along for the ride. That isn't to say that that isn't what happens in reality, right? I mean, again, our models are atoms are connected by springs. Atoms are not connected by springs, right? These are very crude. They're very useful, but they may be so crude that we that, that, that we can't necessarily exclude that from happening, even if we don't see it in our models. Um, because you're right, it is kind of weird. Um, ribulose bisphosphate has to come into the carboxysome at the same rate as carbon dioxide, because those two things come together in the in the in Rubisco to make the product. So somehow there's a disconnect there. I have a question, yeah. Olivia. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, so my question is related to your first part of your talk with the lipid binding proteins. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of related questions. Uh, one, in what time scales do you see the lipid kind of moving through the protein? Um, so what's the time scale in which you observe that? And two, uh, the, the specificities with the different lipids, is that because of the differences in the dynamics or, or do you see differences in the protein itself that confer specificity to specific lipid subtypes? So the, uh, I'll answer the easiest part first. So we believe that there are positively charged residues that are helping to make it so that, oh yeah, all your anionic phospholipids will bind. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to be super specific about the tails. It's mostly like, hey, I want anionic phospholipids to bind and then be transported somewhere else. Um, this is actually like a broadly more, uh, uh, broadly interesting question of like, oh, anionic phospholipids, like in, in humans, the only time you'll see anionic phospholipids on the outside of our cells is when there's an injury because we maintain a, a 
pretty strong gradients between our inner and outer leaflets. And that might also be true in plants. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this, there could be multiple things going on. Um, okay, but in terms of time scale, so, uh, so we ran 10 replicates for a microsecond and within a microsecond, if this protein is in solution and the lipid is also in solution and cannot leave, they will all, they'll basically all bind within a microsecond. Yeah. However, that's like the easy part, right? So uh, in a real system, this protein needs to bind to the membrane and has to find a lipid in that membrane. And somehow one of those lipids has to get sucked out. The time scale for that, we are still trying to estimate. So we can't do that from our equilibrium simulations because it doesn't happen in our equilibrium simulations, mm -hmm. right? We, ha we had to create that system where it's, bound and in solution and they can't separate, which is not physically real. Um, I have seen some numbers from our preliminary data that say this happens on the order of hours. Maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong, but it, it's it's certainly much longer than we can simulate for. Okay, thank you. Um, just one more follow-up question, a technical question. So, do you do do you, any specific um, force fields you use for for lipids or? Um... Um, I, I I was trained with Charm, and Charm hasn't steered me wrong. I I have some like uh, I know that 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 the University of Georgia, uh, especially in the carbohydrate space, is very much uh, amber centric. Yeah, like mm -hmm. um, however, when I go look at the at the Amber force field for lipids, they make some very interesting choices about how they distribute charges. And I don't agree with those choices. Um, and so yeah. I stick to charm, but okay. um, yeah. All right, so Kelvin also asked a different que another question of, so will quantum computing solve the computational cost of any of these types of modeling experiments? Is it naive to think that quantum computers would be better at simulating quantum systems? Um, that, that gets pretty far out of my league. Um, they will definitely be better at solving certain kinds of quantum systems that they are analogous to. I don't know enough about how they work to know how translatable it is to the kinds of work that, that we do, right? Like the stuff that I see right now is basically how to solve the traveling salesman problem more effectively. And that is very different from what we do in simulating things. Uh, so I think that's like, I, I eagerly await to see how, how, how it will be applied, right? So uh, nowadays, I think like AlphaFold and just structure, protein structure prediction has gotten a lot better, a lot faster than we anticipated by using AI and machine learning techniques, which five, 10 years ago, everyone was like, yeah, this will never work. But maybe. Maybe five, 10 years from now, we'll all be using quantum computers for things, but I cannot predict that. Uh, I had a question. So you mentioned the carbohydrate group at UGA. So I'm in that group. Mm -hmm. um, how many of your models do you look at um, the effects glycosylation has, or do you model the full glycans onto proteins? Uh, I saw your 2019 crystal structure just had the one gluknac, so you cleaved off the glycan before you crystallized. So I wasn't sure if in your simulations you added those back on. Um, I'd have to I'd have to look back at the paper. In general, uh, we will put on the ones that are there in the crystal structure, and we will leave out the ones that aren't, because um, again, like like there has been a lot of work that has demonstrated like, especially the like SARS work or the flu work where if you don't get the glycosylation right, you have all kinds of problems in getting the protein, protein structures to be happy and seeing the conformational change and seeing like what is accessible. Uh, so let's see, what is it? ACE2 with the spike. If the spike's not glycosylated appropriately, you, you get the wrong binding interaction. Um, for this case, um, where we were like specifically looking at, hey, does is this more likely than this? We made the assumption that the glycosylations weren't going to matter, and we just kind of didn't think about them too hard. 
Um, that is definitely not true for the carbohydrate binding modules where you definitely need those carbohydrates or those glycosylations attached because otherwise they don't bind correctly. <laughs> um, but that is definitely like something where I think if the tools were better, people would do it more frequently, right? Because right now, um, predicting where glycosylation happens is not easy. And knowing how long those glycosylations need to be is also not easy. And I also don't think that they're necessarily easy to measure experimentally either. So um, things I didn't get to present today because of time limitations is uh, bacterial outer membranes have these lipopolysaccharide like one lethal is just entirely, here's a, a lipid-like thing with a, with a polysaccharide that's attached to it that's maybe twice the, twice the thickness of the actual membrane. Um, when I say maybe twice the thickness, it's like no one actually really knows how that is regulated. Is it always the same thickness? Is it not always the same thickness? We know like the core region, but we don't know how long the appendage is. And that I think is like a emblematic of the problem that like biology knows how to do it, but we don't understand how biology does it. And that's kind of the problem. Yeah, definitely. So, so sorry, um, for the pore, the carboxysome yeah. pore that you had, were any of those proteins like oscillated? Because they had a um, huge critical model and I couldn't tell. Yeah, like, from what I recall seeing, we didn't have to do any patching to add glycosylations on. That does not mean that the real one isn't, but at least right. the individual pieces that are that were solved in the prior M structure do not include glycosylations. Okay. It would be a little bit weird for them to have them because again, these are like in interior to um, uh, like they're inside the bacteria. And any any glycosylations that you're not adding or that you're not using in metabolism that you're adding onto proteins is like, okay, you are, you had to get that sugar from somewhere and get that energy from somewhere. So normally bacteria are pretty stingy about how they spend their carbon, which makes these carboxysome structures really weird because you had to invest a lot of energy to build the shell around the enzymes that you already needed to make anyway. Right. Um, so okay. the, the long answer is, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I just, because I work in the carbohydrate group, anytime there's modeling talk, I gotta ask about the glycan, so. Yep. All right, well, if that's all of our questions for now, um, I'll just, we can kind of like wrap it up. I think we're already a couple of minutes over. So thanks so much, Dr. Vermont for coming and for everyone else for listening in and hope that everyone has a good rest of their day. All right. Thanks, Olivia. Bye. See Thanks. you guys.